no one actually told me how fun it was. Like, I don't、mm. feel like anyone said, you have no idea how incredibly fun this adventure that you're going on is going to be. And if I had started、mm. with like that as the baseline instead of like, oh my God, they're so fragile and they're going to break and I'm going to do it wrong, that was、mm-hmm. sort of almost the way it was presented to me. I really wish that I had known to go into it with a more lighthearted vibe. Because it's ridiculously、yeah. fun. If you're expecting or in the newborn phase, it can be impossible to see through the sleepless nights, trying to do everything right, quote unquote, or even just being grateful for the moment that you're in. And I do not want to undermine how challenging that time can be for you. Today's guest, however, is here to give you another perspective. She's entering another chapter and phase of motherhood as her oldest is about to leave for college. Alana Levine is a highly acclaimed American actress from Broadway, as well as numerous films and TV shows. She's also the host of one of my favorite podcasts, Little Known Facts, where she demystifies the lives of artistic performers. At the end of this episode, you'll find some comfort in knowing how fast time flies and how those impossible phases and crazy obsessions that your child might experience will truly be a blink of an eye. Alana's open heart and warm soul will soothe your feelings that you're in right now, that tornado that you might feel like you're going through. Before we get to the conversation, I have to tell you about a new discovery. Okay, I have a confession. It's safe to say that I spent 95% of the past year and a half in comfy clothes and most days PJs. Yeah, it's true. And you might have too. And you know, that's okay. I give you permission to always be cozy. And lucky for you, I have found the coziest clothes around from Kindred Bravely. From their PJs to their leggings, bras, shirts, and unbelievably cozy sweaters, they're perfect for this fall weather and for always, let's be honest. Every piece of clothing I have from Kindred Bravely is made out of the most luxurious fabric I have ever felt. It's like wearing a soft cloud all day long. The best thing about Kindred Bravely's products is that the founder and CEO, a mother of two, created them with you in mind, a woman and a mom. Since I'm a mama in training, I haven't personally used their nursing bras. However, I surveyed my community of mamas, and almost 100% of them recommended Kindred Bravely over another nursing bra. So if you're ready to get cozy, it's time to treat yourself. Go to kindredbravely.com and use the promo code TRAINING20 to get 20% off. That's K I N D R E D B R A V E L Y dot com and use the code TRAINING20. The link is in the show notes. Here's to getting cozy. My mission here at Mamas in Training is to share insights from moms who have been there. And that's my mission, as I call it. And to speak with you today, Alana, on this topic, you are a perfect example of that because you are a seasoned mom of two. And today we're going to talk about something that's important for, for this other perspective, for this seasoned perspective. So we're going to be talking about. Chapters and phases and obsessions that our children might go through and kind of get a different perspective. And that can, that timing, I, I imagine, can feel so intense when you're a new mom or you're in that expecting phase, kind of looking for how is this all going to unfold. And so I'm really interested to see your perspective because now. You are approaching a different chapter in your life where you're moving into empty nesthood, right? <laughs> and you said this to me on the phone, which was stunning. You said, Certain chapters have a shelf life. So, how are you kind of feeling in this other chapter as it's approaching and evolving? Well, it's so, it's, it's approaching like a fast moving train. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and when my daughter goes off to college, Um, not pre K, which I feel like that was yesterday, but when she goes off to college, she will be leaving behind me and my husband and her little brother. And I think we are all trying to figure out, and, and we'll see, we won't know what it is until it happens, sort of what that shift is going to be in the balance、um, of this family of four. 
And, and it really is, you know, I just had breakfast with all of these friends of mine who I met when Georgia literally was in pre-K. And, and it really feels um, like a blink of an eye. And I didn't understand what that would mean until I blinked. And here it is. But in so many ways, um, I feel really grateful. You know, I'm sure you've talked to people on your podcast and, and know that it is, I mean, you and I are both community people, right? Like in our professional lives and our personal lives. And you somehow become a part of a community. Really, um, it, it's sort of a haphazard thing. Like these are the people that are in the school your kid happens to go to because you happen to live in this certain place. And they become, along with their early teachers in school, these other parents become your teachers as you go. And I was sitting there with all of these parents who I've known for so long now, um, for 13 or 14 years. And I just said thank you to them because I feel like it really was this community that helped raise her and raise me and get us to this moment. Um, and it felt like one of those flip books where you kind of very, you know, you flip through it and you see like all these moments um, and it's interesting, the things that stand out and it's, and it's probably if I watch the video of this life, I can't believe all the things I'm sure I've forgotten that kept me up at night, um, only to be replaced by new things that kept me up at night. So yeah, you and I have been talking about like the phases idea and, you know, there are so many people who seem so certain of how to do things, whether they have this innate sense of how things should be, or if they're very well read, or all of the ways in which people get their information. Um, I've always really loved improv as an actor. It's yeah. one of my favorite things. Some people hate it. My husband is like, what do you mean there's no script? Like that is not his happy place. And I'm like, oh my God, no script. That's fantastic. Yeah, let's go. Um, yeah, I feel very comfortable in that arena. My first my first jobs professionally were, were working that way. And so in many ways, that was very helpful as a parent to sort of hmm. be open to improvising when Completely. things weren't going exactly the way I wanted them to. Um, whereas in some ways my husband had a harder time with that because he would sort of have a script and then things would, you know, pivot to, yeah. to different realities. So, yeah, I mean, it really has to, there, are, there are ways in which you have to really, um, not let other people's opinions of, of all the many opinions and, and we know, um, with the internet and, and just all the ways in which information spreads and is so accessible, um, it's really hard to hold on to yourself and trust and trust and trust yeah. your kid to also exactly. let you know when they're really in trouble and when they're not really in trouble. So to give us a little bit of perspective, take us back just for a little bit on what that experience was like, where you were at in life when you had your two children. What did life look like for you? So I had been um, gratefully a working actor with um, a lot of time spent on Broadway. And so much of that lifestyle, either doing pilots in L.A. or doing theater with a theater company I had in New York or getting to be on Broadway was not conducive at the time to starting a family. Um, yeah. And then I realized, actually, that wasn't true. I just hadn't met the person I wanted to have a family with. Um, mm. And so when I met Dominic, we were doing a play together. Um, suddenly, all of these reasons that I thought I wasn't ready yet went out the window. And because oh. I met this person who I just thought would be an extraordinary partner to parent with, um, I just had an instinct about him. Dominic, my husband, comes from a family. He has, he has nine brothers and sisters. So there are 10 wow. kids in his family. And so I got to see him very quickly when we would visit, you know, Wisconsin, where he's from, which is why they could have 10 kids. That um, many, yeah. <laughs> Not in New York City them. life. Exactly. You <laughs> have space for them. Um, they each have their own drawer. Uh, right. <laughs> I just saw how how comfortable and sweet he was and um, equally comfortable with his nieces and nephews. And I thought, oh, that's really, I like that. And so mm -hmm. um, my age was, you know, I was moving into a, a time where if I wanted to get pregnant, um, I had to start taking it seriously. And I felt really mm -hmm. lucky that uh, the planets aligned and brought this person into my life 
as I was heading into my mid thirties and, and sort of really needing to be serious about it if, if I were going to try. And, right. and what ended up happening, um, is we started to try to have a baby and then we were like, let's get married first. And so <laughs> we put a halt on it. And then we got married. And then a few months later, I was pregnant. And uh, I didn't know if it would go quickly. I didn't know if it would take a long time. I had friends who had such, I mean, the experiences people have um, with doing it, you know, with the help of science or doing it without the help of science. I mean, by the time I was in my mid-30s, the friends I had gone through this with and all of their stories I just was really interested in what mine would be. And um, Georgia was early. She was three weeks early, which felt like six months early. I just was so not there yet. Um, And it's funny, you know, when we talk about phases, right, and right away something happening that I didn't expect, and I had not thought about this until very recently, but when Georgia was born, she had sort of been laying on her nose in a certain way, so it was kind of um, kind of moving toward one side of her face as opposed to when she was born being completely in the middle of her face. And I remember, you know, the doctor comes in and is like, well, it's going to be one of two things. Either it will just, you know, in a couple of hours, it'll kind of move back to center when it's not being laid on or you'll need surgery. <laughs> I was like, oh, those are my two choices. It'll be okay or she'll need two extremes. surgery. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so... <laughs> I remember sort of laying, you know, in those early moments with her sort of very gently, like pushing on her little nose just to see if it might want to go in the center. Um, Yeah. And it didn't for a couple of days. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Um, And then, Mm -hmm. I don't know, five days later, we woke up and it was in the center of of her face. But that's just an example of like for five days, I was like really panicked. You know, the idea of having Mm -hmm. an infant have to sort of get surgery was just so scary. And I thought, well, those early days were really consumed with that. What is that going to look like? Um, you know, is that affecting her breathing? If, if it's, you know, George is going to hear this and be like, what? What? Right. (laughs) (laughs) But it's true. It's all those little things, you know, Mm -hmm. that really, they affect you because you, all of your focus for the first time in your life is pretty much only on this one little creature and keeping this human alive. And so any little thing that potentially could be different or quote unquote wrong or quote unquote abnormal is just really, it overpowers you. And and you used a word when I talked to you on the phone about this whole conversation of phases and obsessions. You said that there were a couple phases and obsessions that specifically your son, but also I I bet your daughter had some too, that you were- and funny ones, yes. I bet. You (laughs) used the word that you were undone by, which I just thought was a beautiful way to describe these things. So how did it feel in that moment compared to maybe when you're looking back to it now? That's so funny. I mean, God, I also just forgot that my son was born with like pulmonary stenosis, which was like a heart issue. And we had to take him and get EKGs like every month (sighs) for a year. And after the year, they would let you know if he had to have open heart surgery or not. And and it's so incredible to me that these are things that, because I'm talking to you today, um, are all coming They're back. coming up. Yeah. With, yeah. with my son, there were so many things that in What to Expect When You're Expecting or then other books about, you know, the, the whole thing is like these markers, right? Like where your kid is supposed to be. Milestones. By a certain time. Yeah. You know, like how many words mm-hmm. do they have and, and are they crawling or are they, you know, rolling over by themselves. But the first thing with both my kids, um, after doing endless amounts of research on sleep training, is both of them really wanted to just be in my bed all the time. And we Mm -hmm. would do, you know, the number of nights we stayed up listening to a screaming baby um, and in New York City, where you know your neighbors are also doing sleep training with you, <laughs> killing and, like, you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. baskets by the front door of everyone on our hallway. Like, I, I hope oh. you're not gluten free because there's so much gluten in this muffin <laughs> that I'm leaving you. Um, please let me know if you have any allergies or dietary restrictions. Because we, I literally like left notes because I couldn't believe how mm. loud this tiny, like 12 pound human, the, the noise is. But all that being said, so yeah. first there was that. It started right away with like sleeping in our bed. 
And then it had to do with how long, I mean, I nursed, but then I would pump. And then like my son still was kind of walking around literally like it was booze, like with his bottle until he was three. And everyone was like, Mm. that's too, he's done. At three, you have to be done. And so we had, Mm. someone decided that that was the age. And we literally read this thing where it said like, go to the mailbox and put all the bottles in a box as if you're mailing them to the babies. And so we go and we like do this whole ceremony where we walk across the street and we bring this package of bottles into and and he gets to put them himself like it's supposed to make him feel very adult all of a sudden. And he (laughs) mailed them to, quote unquote, the babies. And I just have to say for like weeks, he would look at that mailbox and he'd be like, for the babies? And I'd be like, yes. And then we actually, I think we just had to move because it was so painful to have that mailbox on our corner. So we moved. Oh my gosh. Um, so, <laughs> those are like the huge extremes. Oh and then I was like, gosh, maybe in like at three years and two months, he would have naturally like been like, you know what? I see right. other kids and sippy cups seem fine. And, you know, we'll never know. Right. But Then Mm -hmm. his next phase was like he only wanted to wear pajamas. And so we were constantly having to figure out, like, can he go to the wedding in pajamas? Can he go to the graduation dinner in pajamas? Can he go to school in pajamas? Mm -hmm. Um, and, And then that turned into like, okay, you can wear your pajamas under your clothes which actually was the beginning Mm -hmm. of his superhero phase because you know how like Superman (laughs) had his... Wears his costume under Right, has his costume. (laughs) Although Superman would not call it a costume. That was his work clothing. No, Um, no, no. You know, he had his... Correct. So then then suddenly it like morphed into he only wanted to wear costumes. And so this endless thing of like walking through the world with a kid who is doing it his own way... And by the way, and it will be no surprise to anyone listening, my son is so creative and artistic and ended up like learning how to make these incredible costumes. And that turned into filming and creating these very elaborate storyboards where he got all the kids in the community involved in like making these superhero films and even figuring out like dental floss on his wrists could look like Spider-Man doing webs, like, (laughs) like all of this creativity Um, But also him having to navigate like kids being really mean about it. And why are you wearing pajamas? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it would be pajamas and rain boots and all of this stuff. And so I feel like Mm -hmm. the last thing was in order to get him out of the house or to get him dressed was like bribes. Like, I'll get you a Dunkin' Donut. And in Brooklyn, (laughs) Dunkin' Donuts, if you're a Brooklyn mom, these are not like, (laughs) right? These are not healthy donuts. Right. Um, (laughs) And at like 730 in the morning, you would see me pushing a stroller to get to like pre-K by eight with my kid covered in like glazed donut. And I would have to (laughs) deal with like all of these Brooklyn moms looking at me as if Mm -hmm. I've just fed my child poison because to many people, that is poison in their minds, um, right. certainly. Mm-hmm. So so I guess there's the navigating. I think the undone part was more my self-consciousness amidst mm. groups of other parents um, and, and tensions, you know, that my partner and I, you know, my husband and I had very different ideas because right. he came from a more traditional, you know what, sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do, right? Which right. is true. But I was like, I don't know, are these the ones to start battling about? So all that being said is I felt like I was constantly trying to get him to conform to the norm. Um, and that felt very painful. And these are just kind of small, fun examples. I, I don't, you know, this is his yeah. story and I don't want to use this platform to share things that are personal for him that aren't kind of adorable mm. and humorous or for my daughter too. My daughter right, went right. through this phase where everything had to be heavy. She'd be like, is it heavy? And she would like fill a backpack as if she were in training to be like a Navy SEAL <laughs> and we'd be walking around <laughs> the streets of New York oh with like people would be like, why are you making your kid carry like 700 pounds of stuff. Right. Well, I think that's kind of where, that's where it gets tricky is like you talk about this, 
element of, you know, mom shaming and wanting to do the right thing. What even is the right thing? And what questions come up for me in hearing all of this stuff? Because, you know, they are phases. And for the most part, people will, kids will move through them and out of them. But it's how we ride that line as a new parent of wanting to teach your child what's appropriate and how to have good manners, you know, and you probably don't wear pajamas to church or to a wedding, but then again, allowing them to make choices and to feel confident in the choices that they're making and to encourage their creativity. And so that's really where I kind of struggle. I actually had a conversation with my husband about this and we were a little bit split too, because it's like, how, how do you ride that line? So in looking back at it, and, and of course, for everyone listening, this is just Alana's experience and her opinion. I mean, everyone's going to have their own way of parenting, of course, but it's just to give a little bit of understanding and relief to those who might be going through it. So for you, when you look back, how do we ride that line? How do you decide what to battle and what to just move through and past? Yeah, I mean... I, I don't really have an answer. I mean, I, I feel so grateful that so many of these things weren't coming. You know, you know, people deal with such complex, real issues um, for their kids mm -hmm. that are that are truly about, you know, um, wh where there's truly unfixable, unsolvable issues, right? And so I mm -hmm. think I just always try to look at it. Um, you know, you just talked about it. Like empathy has been sort of the slogan of how I approach parenting. All I cared about at the end of the day is that my kids led with empathy in the world. And I have to say, sometimes I was, you know, I've been more successful at that than other times. That's true for me also as a human being. But what's really interesting mm -hmm. is when kids lead with that, they're not always rewarded for that in the world. Um, it's mm -hmm. not always the most empathetic person who who thrives or is um, uh, pointed out as being someone to follow because of their good behavior. So I think all of that is right. to say at the end of the day, I kept going back to, are my kids leading with kindness? And I don't mean to be corny, but I really kept thinking like, what is my priority yeah. of what is important in the world and who they are as humans? And and so sometimes they didn't get to do stuff because they let somebody else do it. And, and, you know, there were ways in which sometimes they were like, well, this isn't working out so great for me. And we just keep coming back to, but yeah. it will, it will in the end, because you're going to feel good about doing mm -hmm. the right thing. And I kept going back right. to, is Caleb kind? Is Georgia being kind? And so as long as that was front and center in terms of who they were, this other stuff felt less, I don't know, I didn't care if he wore pajamas to the wedding, if he didn't care once he got to the wedding right. about what what the response was. And so I ended up just packing clothes or pajamas, yeah. whatever he decided so that when we got to the place, and then I found out later about things I didn't know, which is like tactile, you know, discomfort and the ways certain things felt on him because he couldn't express that mm -hmm. to me. So he actually wasn't just being difficult, like it certain materials didn't feel good to him. And right. I didn't right. know that I actually he express that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I actually I babysit a little boy who every time he goes down for his nap, he wants to turn his shirt around so that the back is on the front and the front is on the back. And that's usually because there's some kind of design or something on there. And he doesn't like the way that it feels when he's laying down against his hands and, you know, yeah. his arms. And so yeah. it, it is interesting. And I've, I've found through babysitting at least that in a way, almost thinking of your child as more of an adult than a child, I've found when I communicate with kids tends to be pretty a pretty good response, you know, asking them to try to explain to the best that they can or kind of instead of necessarily feeling like you have to go with the bribing technique, like, let's make a deal. Let's talk about this situation. Yeah. The other thing that I wish someone had told me, and this is different from the theme of this particular episode, everyone sort of warns you like you're going to be exhausted and you're going to be stressed and suddenly money issues or like all that stuff. 
no one actually told me how fun it was. Like, I don't mm. feel like anyone said, you have no idea how incredibly fun this adventure that you're going on is going to be. And if I had started mm. with like, that is the baseline instead of like, oh my God, they're so fragile and they're going to break and I'm going to do it wrong. And oh my God, I gave her a Cheerio, but it said it was two weeks away till I was supposed to give her a Cheerio. And now, oh my, like everything feels so, um, yeah. Like, has what I, did I just do something that is going to adversely affect the rest of their lives? That was mm -hmm. sort of almost the way it was presented to me um, when I began. And I guess I, I really wish that I had known to go into it with a more lighthearted um, vibe because it's ridiculously yeah. fun. And that is why I am so bereft that my daughter is not going to be living here seven days a week, mm -hmm. uh, every month of the year, because I cannot believe how much I've loved going to school again and like learning things through them and all the stuff that we mm. relearn or learn for the first time through the lens of these really interesting young people who are growing up in a time that is so completely different than how I grew up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they are, I think both of them have been my teachers and had I known to just literally begin this journey as a student, like as if I have enrolled in their class rather than vice versa, um, it would have saved me so much stress. That's a beautiful way of, of reframing it and of thinking about it. And I think it's, it's interesting because I ask a lot of the people on Instagram and a lot of my listeners and community, you know, what do you wish people had told you? What, what do you wish you had known? And oftentimes this does come up. You know, we hear the typical things about postpartum and all of these things your body's going to go through and all of these, you know, milestones. But then also there's what about if you just kind of love it and if it's great and if there's yeah. joy in it and the beautiful aspect of it? So yeah. that's really interesting that you pointed that out. And all those other things are true, right? And I think being, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that you have a community of people. I mean, obviously you want to have great doctors, both for your kid and for you, but but just really telling the truth because I cannot tell you the minute you tell your real experience to someone inevitably nine out of ten times like oh my god me too oh my god me too and and it is and that's a pretty wonderful thing about being a parent in today's world there are a lot of people with yeah. opinions about what you should feed them and and when you should feed them and how they should sleep and you know which sunblock is okay to use and which one you shouldn't use but really at the end of the day <laughs> it is the sharing of our I feel like my book would would say I had no idea what to expect <laughs> And I was expecting that, <laughs> that, that my truth is, yeah. I, I don't know anything and anything that you have to share that might be helpful. I am so grateful for, and I'm happy to share what happened to me today, but there is no expertise connected to it. It is just so yeah. instinctual and to trust our instincts when so much of the time as humans, we're sort of taught not to trust our instincts. It's, it's a relearning um, and building of your own confidence in a thing that you have nothing to base that confidence on. Except like you, yeah. I loved babysitting. I loved it so much. <laughs> I knew I loved being around kids. I knew I found them hilarious. I knew the babies did not bore yeah. me. I love, you know, I love every phase of it. Um, but, you know, there's nothing that you have to really prepare you until you're in it and you really are sleep deprived. And how are you going to function? Yeah. But those are some great tips, especially for women who are expecting and any day now they're going to find their world flips upside down, you know, or for those moms who are new moms who are in the thick of it to really kind of have this, it's hard at that moment because there's, there is sleep deprivation and there is hormones raging through your body and there are opinions and all of these things. But if you can trust your instincts, like you said, if you can think about the, the joy of it and really reminisce on how fast this time does go, you know, and, and days, it's a, it's a blink of an eye. Yeah. It's interesting because I did a, a rebranding and renaming of this podcast. And before it used to be called the pumping podcast and it was more so stories. So I would ask women to take us through their journey of motherhood from pregnancy, birth and throughout. Yeah. And at the end, you know, it was oftentimes women who had younger children 
And at the end, I would always ask them the same question, which I want to ask you today because I think it's a different shift because you're in this place. So the question that I would ask them is, what is something that you would like to tell your child now for when they're 18? But now that you have your children who are entering this new chapter, what is something that you would tell Georgia on that day when she's about to walk out that door or you're about to drive away from that college? Okay, well, first of all, you're going to make me cry because we are just a few days away from that moment. And (laughs) we, you know, there are all of these things that have been coming up from like, you know, like laundry, (laughs) (laughs) Really? No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or never mix Eat something more than ramen. Yes. Do not mix <laughs> yeah. your alcohol. Don't mix alcohol. Stay, yeah. Right. Never leave your drink. <laughs> Hold the same one all night, and you know you can just right. please be careful. Um, you know, I think I think it's sort of the, the same thing that I've said to her in different ways um, since she was born, which is just be yourself. Just be yourself and uh, trust that you're enough. That's always been my hope for her, actually, that she is more than enough. And uh, hmm. that is definitely, you know, I, I think she already has a lot of that. And um, yeah, I want her to trust herself and to be herself and that she is enough just as she is. That's beautiful. And it's a nice reminder, too, for us as we enter this other phase, this other chapter of new motherhood, of expecting motherhood, that maybe we encourage that a little bit more, you know, for our kids to just be themselves. And maybe if, and for us to just be ourselves. And if we want to make a decision about feeding or about sleeping, or if our child wants to wear PJs, or we want, you know, as long as they're not hurting anybody, and they're not going to get hurt, Ultimately, if we just encourage them to be themselves and know that they're enough, there might be a lot more love in the world. So that's a beautiful way to think about this. Alana, thank you so much for your time. Jessica, I am so happy I got to talk to you today. Truly. Thank you. Thank you. I needed this too. Oh, good. And maybe it'll be a nice little gift for your daughter. Maybe she can listen to it once she's at school. Totally. (laughs) Absolutely. I want to just share, I said this with you over the phone before we sat down today. I love, love, loved everything that you have done in the past when I got sucked into Little Known Facts. And then what you're still doing now today. And you started Little Known Facts back in May of 2016. And for those who are listening, if you haven't checked out Little Known Facts with Alana Levine, you have to go over and listen to it, especially if you're like me and you like show business, artistic performers, you really kind of pull back the curtains and share these intimate conversations. And so I just wanted to thank you for the work that you do as Not only, of course, as a performer, but as a podcast host and somebody who's really taken a cool perspective for those who are up and coming into the world of performing because it helps to hear that we're kind of all the same in this. Jessica, you are the sweetest and I'm so glad. The hope is to demystify uh, anything that could be demystified in the artistic process or the pursuing of an Mm. artistic life. And um, thank you for listening. That means the world to me. Absolutely. I'll have a link in the show notes for sure. Thank you so much. Please make sure you go check out Little Known Facts. All the links for Alana and the podcast will be in the show notes. And it was such a pleasure. Thank you. As a mother or a future mother, community is essential. It is one of the biggest tips I hear from moms who've been there. If you love this podcast and want more support and community through your journey, whether you're an expecting mom, an aspiring mom like me, or a seasoned mom, we've developed a community just for you. Join Mamas in Training Premium Circle for only $10 a month. You'll join an exclusive group of strong and inspirational women who are just like you. As a Premium Circle member, you'll join us on Zoom at the end of every month. This is where you'll be able to form strong connections in breakout rooms, share where you're at and what you're feeling, and even meet podcast guests that I bring in to ask your questions directly to them. You will also have access to our private Facebook group for Premium members only, so we can keep in touch throughout the month. And last but certainly not least, you'll get on-air shoutouts in future episodes. Sign up is super easy. Just click on the link in the show notes that says Premium Membership. 
Our next meeting is the last Monday of the month, and I can't wait to see you there. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a review on Apple Podcasts so I know how to better serve you. I'd also love for you to join our community of Mamas in Training on Facebook. You can find me at Mamas in Training on Instagram and at mamasintraining.com. For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together.